decided that they would make it into an information uh -huh. place if they could give any, get anybody to give them any information. Uh -huh. Some of them put it on, on to me. So I wrote out a big long script about, about uh, uh, Cookstown and uh -huh. the railways into... I remember you took two sugar. Oh, you was as bad as me. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is tough, you see. And I went one night to the opening uh -huh. and there were some members of the council there and I said, you know, I come from Stavan, mm. and you come from Cookstown, mm. both the same county. So, but unfortunately, our lovely county of Tyrone is divided by the Sperns, not united. Mm -hmm. So there's people, you know, in in uh, uh, Dungannon that have hardly ever uh, much to do with Oman. Mm. And I dare say there's people in Cookstown that's never been in Stavan. And so I dare say there's people in Cook that I've never heard of Kalider. Mm. And some man says, oh, I heard of it. Isn't there a song about it? I said, yes. Were you ever in it? No. I say, there's people in Kalida who never heard of Coke either. <laughs> no. <laughs> and you know, it's amazing. It's amazing uh -huh. the number of people in Tarumim uh -huh. that don't know one end of it from another. Australia, I suppose it sprawls a fair distance, doesn't it? I know, but uh, wouldn't you think uh -huh. that the... Your own country? And if you mention it, uh, Castle Derrick would say, Where's that? Uh, up the moon somewhere, you know. It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It annoys me to see that there's people living in the place that 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 just don't know. You know. It's not great. Well, uh, could the fact that you revamp them again? Well, look, I was just going to ask you about it. Sure, down the down the hill here a couple of years ago. Thank you. We'll see you tomorrow night. That's the, okay. kind of the, the fair, not the show. Uh, oh, the, the, the fair. Mm -hmm. the, show. But the show, the show see went. Well. Excuse me. See, see you, you see later. Don't be as long the next time. No, it's an absolute pleasure to see you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yeah, so I'll meet you again. You will indeed. I'll tell Sam. I certainly will. I'll call him. He knows Sam Bullock. I'll call him and see him. Will he read? Willie, we have to find out who this Willie Reed is. Margaret. Oh, all the best. You know, your, your, your life is, you've lost a lot by not meeting me, me, I must, me, I must, I must go on. Yeah. German. Right. Bye. Cheerio. Bye. See ya. <laughs> I, well, I was cleaning a show one day. Who, who was this? The man was running it. Oh, he, 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 he lived up the, the road there a bit. Gordon. What is his name? Spear. No, it wasn't Gordon Spears. No, it was Tommy somebody or other. Uh, uh, McGuire, no? Might have been, I'm not sure. But he, he seemed to be running the show. That was about ten years ago or something. No, ten years ago it was run by the Castle Derrick Development Association. Castle Derrick what? Did Tommy was doing MC or something, was it? Up to 1996. Was he doing MC? I can't remember. I can't remember what it was. But anyway, it was a good show. I mean, I had, uh, wasn't it uh, Derek McGaffey doing the uh, yeah. uh, doing the MC the MC mm -hmm. and there was donkeys show and I wrote a Sammy was on the get then what Sammy on the get them names might have been mm. and I remember I wrote a bit in the in the column about Kalita's show mm. there were men from the, they came in in shirts they came to see 
the, the sights in in skirts and tights at the, at, at the good Kilitner Fair or something like that. Mm. Can't remember that about it. But anyhow, it went down to end and it was great fun. But um, sure, everybody knows about Kilitner, at least I think so. Mm. If they don't, they should. There's a Reverend Lyons up there uh, at one the, time. He was near the one that uh, nearly married Muldoon. That's right. <laughs> Is that true? It was true, surely. But I heard of that many a time. Well, yeah. you know the, the present Muldoon's the builder lads, the big contractors in the town here. It was, it was their father. For goodness sake. Uh, they didn't realise they, they had nearly had <laughs> two families to look after. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, well, uh, uh, the mistake was, you see, that... Um, uh, he was a wee bit deaf or something. Are you the groom? Mm. Uh, he said, are you Muldoon? Are you the groom man? Ah. And only when he was signing the register found out he wasn't the groom, he was Muldoon. Mm. Mm -hmm. But that story has been going around the world. I remember reading it in some uh, magazine or paper somewhere that uh, it's it 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 like the Irish, Irish clergyman who nearly married the taxi man or something other like that, you know. Good story. Good well, story. The Reverend Lyon had a big long poem about that area. Had he? You didn't know it, no. Well, wouldn't I tell you, there was a girl I knew on the railway, Vera Sullivan from Oman. How's the farm, Tommy? And she married a girl, mm -hmm. a fellow How's called farm? Tom. Mm -hmm. uh, Vera Hurst from Oman and Tom Sullivan the, of Newton, of Philaile. And uh, he had a brother, he had an uncle, uncle he Tom. He owned a copper deck. Copper who was yeah. a cousin of Megan Collins. <laughs> yes. And I was at the wedding and at the reception. Well, sure, it's good to get the order. Uh, what do you hear this, Seamus? And Vera, the it's great, she had a friend, Turkington, in Portadown. She invited her to the wedding. Father Tracy of Newton of uh, Stewartstown was talking afterwards and he said, this, I wouldn't like to say this was the biggest wedding ever was at, for it wasn't. But it's the most, uh, I think, most representative area I was at. Now, I wouldn't like to say that the people were here from hell to Connacht, but they're here from Portadown to Balna, and Balna is in Connacht. <laughs> 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 I thought that was very well. He and I had a great chat afterwards, and he says, Barney, you must come and see me someday. And I remember one, was it a Saturday I was off, and I, I went to, to uh, Colel. And either Vera or Tom um, took me out to see Father Tracy and we started to talk and honest to goodness it must have been, I was going to say it was the clouds of night, it was about 7 o'clock before we caught on that it was 7 o'clock, you know. He had a great fund of stories and so had I and we were a great chat. But Uncle Tom, as he called no, he was a cousin of Michael Collins and he was telling me one time, um, and this is his word to see, was from God great to take Michael away the hell or every day down the road to see, see the country in the terrible state that it's now in. And so he thinks, oh, so see, sure. the, everybody's fiddling, everybody else. <laughs> and see, the people, there's people running about See, Balna getting military pensions, and what did they do for it? Nothing. And they told me then about he and a crowd of fellas were they, they were detailed to go out to Kalala Coast Guard Station and uh, take it and burn it because the British military were going to occupy it. This was in 1920 or something. Like that. So there's about uh, see, I was in charge of a detachment. And there was about half a dozen, maybe seven or eight altogether, and we went out. And we got the decent woman, man, an Englishman, a decent man. He got his stuff out in the street and all the rest of it. Got his wife and youngsters in the street and made sure that they were all right. And then we went in and threw some petrol around the, the station. And then to see, damn the one of us smoked. We hadn't a match. Not only for the decent man going into the kitchen and bring us in a box of much. We never been able to do it at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to Diana, 
Oh, I see. Of course, he was looking down the muzzle of a revolver at the time. Maybe that helped him to go in to look for the matches. But he told me, do you know, to see how many, there was about seven of us who did the job. And you know how many are drawn military pensions in Balna for that job now, as I know? About 80. <laughs> Did you see Jim open walls these nights? Jim who? Jim Webster. No, I haven't seen him open walls He's upstairs on this floor. But anyway, Joe Sheridan. Joe Sheridan. Well, I was down, I was cycling around by Limerick direction and I went out to Fynes and I saw the planes, the slain boat sitting around there. And I went into the place which was a sort of a I think it was the Montague Arms Hotel or something like that. And I remember it was a sort of a drizzly day and I went in for a cup of tea. And somebody uh, gave me a cup of tea and I heard somebody saying, Hey, Joe! So Joe gave me a cup of tea. And I, I didn't know until afterwards that that was Joe that made the famous Irish coffee, Gaelic coffee, for some American guy who was so cold. So there's a story of the, the Gaelic coffee. And talking about that, it's made out of uh, whiskey and sugar and cream and one thing or another. And there was one American guy there one day and he said, how do you make this stuff, you see? And he had a glass in his hand. And somebody said, well, we put in the whiskey and they put in the water and we put in the cream and we put in something else and we stir it all up. And he says, so you put the whiskey in first, the whiskey down the road. Well, he says, uh, I suppose I'll get to it sometime. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. It's great to see you. Great to see you. And Pat and Joe, long may you live. As the same saying, long may your lung break. That's true. <laughs> God bless you. I was out in New York one time and I met Paul Quigley of Straban. Now I knew the Quigley people very well, the butchers, Jimmy and Winnie and Michael and Paul and I was waiting to get a plane home and I was in Stanton in New, uh, New York Central Station and a fella came up and hit me a bladder behind the, the back. He says, what the hell are you doing here? Turn around. Paul Quigley says, hey, I'm waiting for a bus to go out to the airport to take me home. You'll do no such thing see you're coming home with me. I said, I have a flight booked out, I have the books to see. Go on. So he took me out anyhow. And for a couple of days I stayed in New York with Paul Quigley. And the only man, the only thing that he didn't introduce me to was the Statue of Liberty. He knew everybody under the sun. And no matter where he went, and everybody knew him. And he brought me into some Irish pub and who was singing in it with a fella called Charlie McGee from Derry. But in any case, um, uh, he brought me out to a tennis place which was called Forest Hills. It was the equivalent of Wimbledon and uh, it was grass court. But the grass didn't grow very well because of the diesel in the atmosphere and he used to have to put the grass down like a carpet. And of course he had to smooth it out and make it sure. And the man that did this was a man called Sheridan. And he came from uh, Castle Derg, between Castle Derg and Drum Quinn. And he started his work by tidying up the edges of the, the, the banks and the, the roads around by Drum Quinn, Drum Quinn Castle Derg. But anyhow, he got to be the man in charge of the uh, Forest Hills International Tennis Court, where all the great international players played before they went to Wimbledon, or maybe afterwards, and they got. But he says, see, you know, he had to be very careful because um, if there was a sort of a dinge 
or a hollow or anything, the ball would hit it and bounce away and some of these guys would miss it. And it would cost them maybe thousands of dollars. And there was one, on. He's just one fellow one He's time going. came to me. He lost the match. And he says, he, that's the worst goddamn court I ever played on in all my life. There's holes all over it. And I said, is that so? Well, listen here, guy. The guy that beat you played in that goddamn court. There you are. That's something for you to think about. Oh, you would know that. And that, uh, and that man here, a friend, everybody. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And that man, I thought I could cycle. I went, I went to Belfast to Dublin one day, I thought it was a great fella. Uh, he went in Belfast to Dublin back. Oh, back yeah. one day. Oh, one, one day back, and no bothered him. And no bothered him at no, all. That's right. and, and he's only 67 or something or 70, ah, okay, 76 or something. Young like fella, that. that's right. And I'm 93. Oh, but you're. Who's that you? Oh, I don't know. I have oh, sore back, I have pains in my back and pains in my knees. And pains all around the place, but thank God. You forget all about them. I got rid of the dandruff. Oh! <laughs> right. With uh, uh, Burr Castle. Oh, you right. you mm -hmm. probably know this mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't remember now. But I'm sure you've heard of it. Oh, I heard of it, I. I uh, now. No, what we're desperately looking for is some information on the manner of Hastings at the moment. Now, who was Hastings? Well, uh, that was the Edwards connection, you see. Oh, I see. Uh, you know, uh, 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 Castle Gore. Aye, uh, Castle Gore. Uh, yeah. But uh, there's no, absolutely no remains of the house at all, you know. Oh. Well, the house is there now, but it's all over sprawls. Yeah. But there was a plaque on the house many years ago, which was a pity it was destroyed, uh, you know. So I'm trying to go to the public record office to see if they have any information. Well, you're going to include the bust of... Uh, oh, very much. Ferguson. Oh, that one's in it. Uh, oh, that one's in it. So. And we have the one in London there as well. Is there one uh, there too? Well, there's a statue out in, uh, oh, why, in the, the park. Oh, that's right. Brook that's park. Right. Brook pa park. I've forgotten about uh, that. Brook Park. Boys, my father and mother came from Derry, and, and I remember uh, as a young fellow being taken by my hand and round Brook Park. My father told uh -huh. me this, that, and other thing. And uh, what was in it was the Knox uh, coach. Oh, right. The, that um, Knox of Brahim. Uh -huh, all right. Uh, oh, that's a big uh, gentry. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where? Uh, Mm. And uh, half Hag McNaughton stuff. Oh, that, that story, yeah. And um, my this lady wants to take Terry Oti. Oh, 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 very nice to you. Oh, I love so nice to meet you. Victoria Bridge for the winter of 1930. Uh -huh. Imagine. Uh, you can hardly believe it. But the wee tram came down, mm -hmm. and Bob Porter was the, uh, oh, the, the tram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I never saw anybody that could write as well as Bob. Right. Wonderful. And he was standing there in the van and was shaking from and he was writing away, you know. And we came down one day, I said, Sir John, Bob, how is it that you're such a great writer and you can write so well and that tram shaking? Ox to see soon you get used to it. Uh. How would you get used to it? See, when I go home at night and want to write a letter, I have to get the wife to shake the table. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Yeah. And she was down from Kilita. Mm -hmm. She was Madge O'Donnell. Uh -huh. But in the winter time, to be near town and house of Washington, she come to stay with Johnny Wilson over at Arne. Uh -huh. yeah. And she used to visit the woman beside us, Mrs. Doherty, who had a wireless. Very few people had wireless. Oh, that's true. Really true. And she used to come in, and Barney was on the wireless. She said, I was up the other day around front, and man, there are quite nice girls up there. I think I'll go up next Sunday, maybe on the bicycle. And she would say, Hey, you just should do that. She actually thought because she could hear you, that you could hear her. She uh, used to speak oh, under the words. Oh, right, aye, aye. And well, I thought, you know, I said, my God, there's some people. Oh. We were only youngsters oh, at the time. There's me in 1942 from Radio Iron. I was then, that's, that's, that's. And uh, that's what went into the microphone. Oh, and that's what the that came out. <laughs> oh, that's, that's, the, that's the best picture of them all. Oh, yeah, that's you that's, see that uh, there, look. That was the first Ulster television show, mm. and there was me standing, and a fella had a bush behind me, do you see? Mm. And he's holding up the bush. Oh, I sure did. Uh, and he, he couldn't help hold it, it was shaking that much. <laughs> and, and some lady wrote in to say, isn't it very nice to see actual uh, natural television yeah. instead, of, instead of the 
uh, BBC stuff, you yeah. see. Uh -huh. And look at the old man out in the countryside and the fresh air yeah. waving the bush. Man. You weren't an old man at that time. <laughs> I, I don't know. Well, that no, you weren't. 1950, you wouldn't have been. No. But, uh, no, I remember that as well, Madge chatting under the words. <coughs> I did, I'm sure. I, I, right, you know, she thought. <laughs> well, I'll oh, tell you a good one. Eh? I'll tell you a good one. This is quite true. I was um, doing something on the late, late show one night mm. and uh, I came into the audience, you see, and I poured round the women and all that sort of thing and had a great chat. <laughs> Stayed overnight with a brother-in-law of mine in Dublin and he used to go to a church in the next morning and it was a fairly hoity-turdy church because there was the Honourable Miss Guinness there. Yeah, see? Right, yeah. And um, yeah, the next morning, and he said, good morning, Miss Guinness. She said, oh, good morning, Mrs. O'Reilly. Uh, and your friend, oh, this is my brother-in-law from the north. Oh, you're from the north. Mm. So you don't have to listen to that, what is it, Mrs. O'Reilly, they call it, if, uh, um, uh, radio, music, if, if Ariane, something. Oh, you, maybe you saw it last night uh -huh. on the television. And he says, no, I didn't see it. Oh. And she said, well, did you see it? No. Were you watching it? I said, no, I wasn't. No. She said, well, look, there must be some limit. There's a limit and there's a standard that one must keep. And I'm going to write to the Minister of Broadcasting or something, tell him for goodness sake, it's a shame. I, he was a firmless old creature. I could hardly sing. I could hardly sleep all night from scratching. Sit you here down for what is it? What's going on now? Yeah. I, I was in the last one day. This is a builder here. And I was, uh, yeah, I wanted to get a train. This is Mr. McDevitt. Nice to meet you. And, yeah. and yeah. then Sam the next train was, was very good. Yeah. 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 And Mr. One o'clock, I said to the driver, could you cut my hair and let me get the ten past one train? And she said, I could cut your hair and let you get the ten past one Tell Sam who you were up there. There must have been some talent about barbers because there was a man I don't really remember, not a Andy Cain. Oh, you sure? Yeah. I think Andy Cain called him barber. But this fella came up. I went down, he was up from Dundalk on holidays. With friends in Castle Fun and even a great And when it came his turn, Andy sat him down in the chair and he started to climb us up. Uh, Who's your Uncle Wooly getting on? Yeah. 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 Uh, your Uncle Wooly, is it? I'm trying to look at both of them. Why? Well, that's Uncle Wooly. He was taking on the barber, you see. Oh, I'm sorry, he says. That's tricky. I only cut hair on a man once before like that. Only cut hair like that before, he says, on one man. He cut his hair like this Wooly Gallagher, Castle Fun. No, and he says, that's the same hair, and I thought maybe you were right. <laughs> and your man says, well, I was with you, but says, I'm his nephew. Oh, well, 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 Andy Cain recognised him by his hair. Mm. Don't, don't take any offence to tell you. I heard a great story about a young fella. Uh, Mr. Daly has... No, you shouldn't have given me tea. Oh, no, sure, I'm all right, too. This young fella went into the barber shop somewhere, and he said, why did you cut my hair? Well, uh, I was, uh, was cutting well. Uh, <laughs> and I was able to follow her. I'm but going to Italy. Instead of going up to the school, you're going to Rome. You're going to Rome. Mm. Okay. Going to Rome. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I this one. No, I didn't. Do you see, do you expect to see his holiness? Oh, I. But to see, sure, there'll be 25,000 there. Who might see with him and me having a personal chat? You're going to have your private audience. You haven't all. So eventually, he said he would. Well, to see, look, if you come and tell me. All about it. Um, so anyhow, uh, sorry, you came back in about a month's time. I'll take a wee bomb, eh? Right? You came back in about a month's time. You, you better sit so there in for your time far too long. Yeah, yeah, you? He says, uh, well, were you in Rome? I was. Well, did you see his holiness? I did. Right. Were you speaking to us? I was. Was he speaking to you? Hey, what did he say? Cut the hair. That's pretty good. I thought you were going to tell the one the fellow told you that he's good. This old parish priest, he went up the, up the lane, and three miles out of the town, he went up to visit this couple every, mm -hmm. every month. But after two or three years, there was no family. And he says, Mary, he says, 
I thought it would be a wee bit of company, but now, no, she says, they're no company, we're not blessed with children. Well, he says, I'm leaving, I'm up here to bid you goodbye, for I'm going to Rome, he says. And he says, there's a candle over there in Rome, he says, and I'll light it for you, that you'll get a wee bit of company. So that was already way back to Rome when he was away about seven or eight years and he came back again and he thought he'd call up and see his old friends. And ended up and there was one, three, three wee boys and four came on and out one just like steps of stairs. And he says, my goodness, you've company, I have. I left the candle. And he says, where's your husband? Where's John? She says, he's away to Rome to put out that candle. <laughs> It's 40 years on Valentine's Day since the last train ran from Porto down to Derry. Is that right? Last train. Four years. I'm an ex, and I'm an ex-railway man. That'd be right. And I'm a jumping man. Since right. 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 Come on. There's a woman in Stavon called Mary Mac Margaret McGuinness. Right. And she lived in Derry with her husband and all that. I was in her in Stavon. Right. And she went up to see the mother and father. Mm. And she went to the train. The last train. Yeah, right. right. to Derry. So, um, and on the route, she went into the lavatory. Mm. And when she got into the area, she couldn't open the limit thing. Mm. And it was locked, and she battered at it, and she battered at it. Right. And the train had come into the station, and it had been emptied. Everybody was gone, and she was screeching. And she thought to herself, in years to come, they'll find me like an Egyptian mummy yeah. up in some place or other. Yeah. What did they do? Mm. And somebody, yeah. the porter, came around the train to see what had wrong. I heard the screeching. And she dashed, she opened the door and she dashed out and she ran down. She ran down through Port the, down to the dairy station. And the foreman was at the door, shutting the gate for the last time in history. And she dashed out the train. And she was the last person, you know. And I have a wee bit in the paper. Oh dear, what can the matter be? Margaret McGuinness was locked in the lavatory. She was with her for some time on Saturday on the last three of Mr. Bath. Well, would I tell you something now? They never should have put that train out. Never should have put it in anymore. Because I'll tell you what. We're reaping that. The world won't know. I'll tell you what's wrong. Mainly bad. Provided the freight didn't well, pay and I know we've come to home yeah. and then had me putting a lorry and carried it away to the moon. Yeah. No. You could have still done, done the freight with the lorry, but now that when the wee modern diesels, we three carriages, we commuter yeah. twins, could have scooted up and down there at yeah. little cost. Oh. And, and do the what story do. was. There's no one's got them, my nieces and mine. And, and the boy came along on his bicycle, very respectful, let his clips open the gate. And the train came the tickets, let them out. As soon as the horse disappeared, he went, away. he went somewhere to do something else. The next train came. Mm -hmm. He wasn't there all the time. There was too many permanent waymen as well. And all you needed, and now we have vending machines, John. Oh, well, that's right. Uh, Go and put your, your two pound in and get your ticket at three pound. Story and don't be an insta. The story at the time was it doesn't pay. It's not a solvent service. And I said to Bill Craig one time, I may not be a solvent service, but it's a social service. That's right. He said, is Stormont a solvent service? Have you ever seen the balance sheet of Stormont? Is that policeman over there got a good balance sheet? No, that's true. No, it's a good service. And, and as you say, they, they know the, the mistake oh, there. So sad. But the boys that put it off, they're not to be had. No. no. There were two or three college men no, on the road. They're all redundant. To set up the study this way. They're redundant. Oh, yeah. 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 Listen, it's a pleasure meeting you. Pleasure meeting you too. I'll be reading your call. Oh, yeah. 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 Thanks very much. Right. Oh, yeah. Right. 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 Right.